welcome back to the Lewa Show for a new edition. We're coming to you from the Apex House in Port Moresby and I have some very important guests with me on the show today and I'd like to introduce them. Over here we've got Professor John Vince, Deputy Dean, Academic and Research, School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Thank you so much for joining us today, Prof. My pleasure, thank you. Dr. Evelyn Lovell, Director, Central Public Health and that is part of the National Department of Health. Thank you for your time, ma'am. Thank you. And Dr. Paki Molumi, CEO, Port Moresby General Hospital. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Are you guys all right? I feel like there's a bit of <laughs> tension we're here. We're, we're all ready. good. Should we be doing some stretching just to get everyone <laughs> at ease? We are ready. All right. So what I wanted to ask you guys, or maybe just go into more depth, is about the medical symposium that just happened. So that was the 55th medical symposium. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. So if you'd like to share some of the highlights of that or what were the goals going in and how you achieved them and your plans in next year's symposium. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe I'll start off on that because uh, uh, for my sins, I was the uh, chairperson for the scientific committee. So at last year's symposium, which was held in Medang, the group decided that this year's symposium should focus on medical education. but. Shortly after that, it was decided that we should make it a little bit broader to health education. Uh, and on that basis, we decided to um, break the symposium into, into three segments, if you like. The first segment was specifically to deal with medical education, with the education of doctors mm -hmm. and laboratory technicians and allied health workers. Um, and so the whole, the whole of the first day was focused on, on that issue. And the, there are a number of outstanding issues related to that. Um, the second day was education for, for us as a medical profession. Right. So it was updates on, on the major health problems of the country like TB and HIV and, and so on, um, maternal health and so on. And the third day was focused on health education for the, for the general population. What's, what's happening out in the provinces to try and improve um, health knowledge of, of the general population. So that, that's how it worked out. Um, wow. we, had, uh, we, had, we were oversubscribed for, for papers. Wow. So we had to cut back on them. Some people got disappointed, obviously. But that was the basis on which we, on which we, uh, um, on which, on which we allocated the various papers. Uh, on the first day, related to uh, medical uh, education, specifically, we had over overseas experts. Um, we had the uh, dean of the uh, of the faculty of medicine at James Cook University. Oh, wow. uh, we had somebody from the Pacific uh, um, Accreditation Board. Uh, from New Zealand, uh, Professor Ellis, um, and 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 so and we had um, other people interested in medical education in, in Papua New Guinea. Um, so that was that was how the that was how the program was set out, and it, it seemed seemed to work uh, reasonably well. We had we had quite good feedback from people who were there and said that was a reasonable way uh, to plan things. Well, so, congratulations! I did hear it was it was a success. Yeah, it was. It was. You you presented there as well. What were your thoughts about that? Well, it was generally very well organised, and um, I presented a paper on TB, which I will emphasise in the next segment. And did you you obviously attended as well, or were you yes, yes, presenting? I'm actually the treasurer, and I was oh. the chair of the fundraising committee. Oh, fantastic! Well, congratulations! You were able to have it at the Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah, basically that's it's a 55th as you said. Is a, and the medical society has been doing this for the last 55 years. So uh, I mean, many people ask why old symposiums every year, but if you look at it, uh, it's one of the objective of the medical society is to work with the national department of health mm -hmm. to come up with uh, government policies, mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, we we deliver those policies with evidence based. So in, in meetings like this is where evidence, scientific evidences are being presented so that we convert them into policies. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the, one of those is the, uh, like the uh, immunization programs that we are doing. Uh, the immunizations that we give are actually derived from those, uh, those uh, yeah, the scientific papers that come out of that. The 2015 was the on uh, women's health and the, currently we are driving the 
uh, HPV vaccinations for, to prevent the cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. And that came out of the 2015 uh, medical symposium. So, so and, uh, the medical knowledge is changing, so it's very important that we all this uh, uh, programs every year, so we support the National Department of Health mm -hmm. with up-to-date uh, government policies. Right. Now, Prof, how, how important are these symposiums to the profession, the medical profession here in, in the country? How important is it? He said that you, they're held every year. Some people may ask why every year. Oh, okay. How well, okay, they're, they're extremely important for a number of reasons. Uh, one reason is because it allows us to, to keep up to date with what's going on. I mean, if you're working out in uh, Vanimo or WeWAC or some, some of the smaller centres, it's, it's very difficult to keep absolutely up to date in terms of m maybe change in health policies or, 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 or new ideas coming in. Um, we, we hear from the research uh, people, the experts in research, the PNG Institute of Medical Research, uh, we hear from our own researchers within the school and around other areas and internationally as well. We have a large international um, following. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very important for our, for our own education uh, and then the people that attend, the doctors that attend, can, can take, take the messages back and educate their own staff. But it's also very important for, from the point of view of cohesion of mm -hmm. the profession. Um, we're, we're, we're a fairly tight-knit profession. Um, we're quite proud of the fact that we, we work quite well together. And as, as part of the main symposium, we have, we have specialist society symposiums. So the pediatricians, the obstetricians, the pathologists, everybody has their own uh, separate meeting either before or after the main symposium. Uh, and that gives an opportunity for um, you know, the, the, the internal medicine people to focus on their mm. particular areas of concern. The obstetricians obviously mm. focus on issues of maternal health and so on. Um, so it's not, it's not just the medical society itself. It's, all, it all, it all, it's all everything that happens around the symposium uh, and it gives everybody, everybody a sense of belonging to the profession and, right. and we see that as being very important. Fantastic. All right, we'll take a short break while you freshen up there mm -hmm. and we'll be back with, with more. Okay. You are watching The Lower Show, don't go away, we'll be right back. wonderful, intelligent, very smart medical officers here with me today. <laughs> Did you like my little introduction? <laughs> All right, a little bit of a laugh before we get into the serious questions. Dr. Malumi, as CEO, newly appointed, congratulations, of Port Moresby General Hospital, obviously you do have a really huge task ahead, if I, if I can say, say that. One of the main issues or complaints that we've always heard in the past, even to now, is the overcrowding. Would you agree? And do you have plans to fix that? Yes. Uh, the Port Moresby General Hospital is, uh, is uh, in our health system, it's a level seven hospital. Level seven? It's level seven. So what does that mean? The level seven means we, we will be providing uh, specialist services. Okay. In fact, super specialist services. So you have the level six hospital, which is uh, uh, the regional hospitals in uh, the islands, uh, Bomase, Angao, and then uh, Ningine Islands, uh, Nonga Hospital. So four regional hospitals, they're level six, and then the provincial hospitals are five, so it goes to okay. like that down. Okay, gotcha. uh, so level seven is supposed to, to provide, uh, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a hospital to provide super specialist services. Also, the Port Moresby General Hospital is a teaching hospital, so we are very close with the School of Medicine and Health Science. So we uh, we train undergraduates as well as postgraduate students. So this hospital is uh, well over 20 years, built over 20 years ago. It's a 1,200-bed hospital. Over the over the years, we've increased from 600 to 1,200 bed now. So. Uh, we are serving uh, all of National Capital District. 
Central Province, parts of Gulf, and also referrals that are coming from uh, outside other of the other province as well. So basically, the population has expanded, but services have remained the same. So that basically the overcrowding that you see in our clinics and uh, in our in our labor wards, especially, you know, we are doing uh, 15,000 deliveries a year. Would you agree in, in the overcrowding? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, very, very As a doctor, how yeah. Exactly. So we are running 500 prescriptions a day, trying to. So it is. It is. Uh, it is very. Expected, uh, the population has expected uh, expanded in the city, so it's it's uh, that is the main reason why PMG is uh, overcrowded. And in, in your experience as a doctor, how does that affect healthcare, providing healthcare? Maybe you can assist with that answer, Dr. Lovell. Well, the beds are full. <laughs> Can't admit patients, and then there's overcrowding and accident emergency beds are full so you know patients come but there's no way to stay and that, that poses a big problem and they can't be treated well in the wards in accident emergencies there's no space as well so you know, it goes backlog from one stage to another do you have plans to curb this yes, problem yes. basically as i've said in the in the, in the system mm. There are different uh, level seven, then you have level six, yeah. level five, and level four. So, that's all capital district. Does, there's no level five hospitals. Okay. There's no level six, so, uh, so to speak, level six hospital here. So, basically, Port Mosby General Hospital is functioning. The function of a level five, level six, and at the same time, we are doing level seven. So, if PMG is uh, for PMGH to function as a true level seven, we need to offload those functions. Right. So, which means uh, we need four district hospitals <coughs> in the city for the four uh, for the four four districts. Uh, central hospital uh, to uh, take care of the uh, population of the central province. So that is part of your plan. Yes, I mean it's not it's not but most of general hospitals plan. But uh, if if those things come on board, then we can offload some of those uh, services and we can uh, perform as a true level 7 hospital. Right. You agree? <coughs> yeah, yes, I do. I mean, I, I think that for a long time um, people have been talking about setting up um, um, satellite hospitals, if you like, within within Port Moresby itself. And, and you know, years ago there was talk about a central province hospital, wasn't there? But it never got off the ground. Um, so at the minute, uh, uh, Garahu uh, Hospital yes. functions as a level four, really. Yeah, it's right? really a level four. Yeah, um, and and that's certainly taken off, taken the load off PMGH. But the problem is, you know, the population of Port Moresby is doubling about every ten years, about every ten years. So, you know, when I first came here, the population was seventy thousand. The population now is closer to a million. So that's, that's the sort of population pressure that, that uh, not just Port Moresby, of course, but if you go to Mount Hagen, you'll find exactly the same thing. Any of the, any of the major hospitals, you'll find exactly the same thing. Patients have to wait a long time. Um, beds get full. The, the, the capacity of the hospital to look after inpatients is, is stretched. Um, there are staffing issues in a, in a lot of cases. So, so um, you know, I think sometimes, sometimes we we get too focused on the bad things, uh, and people don't understand the pressure that the health system is under. But there's a lot of good things happening as well, and so I think we should not always focus okay. on on the difficulties. We should look at the good things that are happening, and there are lots of good things happening as well. Exactly. So, Dr. Mulumi, the other the other current or issue that most talk about, I would say, is cancer as a killer, right? It is a real killer in our country. I've, I've lost a couple of relatives to cancer. And there being a lack of facilities, per se, to, to treat it, to even diagnose it, first of all. What's your take on that? Yeah, on, on cancer is a, it's a big issue in the country. I think it's 
it's a, it's a, uh, especially cervical cancer, oral cancer now is quite common. I'm head neck surgeon, ENT surgeon myself, and uh, the ENT clinic is filled with uh, uh, oral cancer patients. So cancer is a big issue, but uh, I mean the government is taking this on board to ensure that we have a proper mm. cancer facilities. Uh, for Port Moresby General Hospital, we have been allocated 25 million to build a cancer facility, which is uh, under construction right now. So that's a positive thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but <laughs> can I can I just make sure. an interruption because in the in the symposium, one of the one of the papers which was produced by one of our over which was presented by one of our overseas uh, colleagues was on, on oral cancer. And, and w what he's saying is that in 10, 15 years from now, it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. Why? Because children as young as five or six are chewing betel nut. And smoking. We, and smoking. We, yes. we, know what, we know what the issues are that cause uh, oral cancer, but increasingly younger and younger people are chewing betel nut and smoking, yeah. and there'll be a 15, 20 year interval, maybe even shorter than that, before we start seeing them presenting with oral cancer. Yes, so we've, we've, we've seen very young age, the, uh, the youngest I saw was 22 year old, so. coming with, uh, mm -hmm. with cancer, mm -hmm. so that means we started chewing betel nut at a very young age mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. so, so building facilities and uh, you know, having sophisticated equipment to treat, it's not really the answer. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's prevention, uh, prevention is very important. Key. Prevention is the key. Yeah. So the more we invest into prevention and early diagnosis and treatment, then uh, we, we can cut down the cost of healthcare. Fantastic. That's a good point to end on, Dr. Mulumi. You're watching the Noah Show. We'll be right back with more. <laughs>
So in the country now, we have multi-drug resistance TB. And globally, and within the Western Pacific region, we rank about 14 among the 14 high burden countries. Wow. When we say high burden, TB is very common and associated with drug resistance TB and also associated with HIV. Okay. Human immunodeficiency um, virus was an epidemic until recently, although it's controlled, patients with TB have bad immunity. I mean, with HIV, have bad immunity and are prone to develop um, TB and especially multi-drug resistance TB. So those three places I mentioned, NCD, Port must be NCD. NCD also caters for central province like Dr. Molume uh, mentioned and also Gulf province. The highways are linked, so when you don't find medicine in your health center, the ICS way is let's go to Port Mosby. So that, that adds burden to the already overburdened um, hospital like Port Mosby General. So the other area is Gulf province. So in these three provinces, we have high rates of multi-drug resistance TB. That means that we have to look for newer drugs to treat these patients. And they are very expensive and they don't easily come by. And if patients don't take medicines properly and complete the regimen, then they will develop resistance to these new drugs as well. It's so a very we, scary thought. We have to be really careful. Yes. We have to be really careful. NCD itself makes up 25% of all the TB cases in the country. So when we test Putin by this new machine, which is called Gene Expert, and fortunately we have them through the country now. And as we test more, we have a system where the results are recorded on our phones. We are seeing wow. these cases throughout the country. This week we have been reporting from Kundiawa Hospital. So as you see more patients, you diagnose more cases. And we have to have the drugs to treat these patients. So apart from drug sensitive, which respond to treatment, we now have this problem of drug resistance TB. So, you know, to the public, if you have people around you who are coughing, lost weight, take them to a nearest health center, get their sputum tested, and make sure that they are treated. And those people, you know, we live in big families. That's good, but you also have to supervise the treatment for your relatives so that the treatment is completed. We find that, you know, it's 20 times more common if you didn't take your treatment to have drug resistance TB than new patients. Having said that, drug resistance TB now is in new patients. You don't have to have TB before. Wow. You can develop drug resistance TB the first time. Mm. So that's the scary part and I think Prof will elaborate on TB in the children. Yeah, can you talk a little bit, yeah. Yes, I mean TB, well, many years ago people in the, in the TB Areas said, oh, you know, TB in children is not a problem. And we kept on saying to them that, well, in Papua New Guinea it really is because 25% of our inpatient beds are occupied by mm. children mm. with TB. Mm. Uh, and now the international community has recognized that, yes, TB is, is a problem in children. It's, it's not so much a problem from spreading it within the community, but it devastates children and it devastates family. Um, you know, children get TB in the bones of the back and once that happens it compresses the spine and then they can't walk and there's nothing we can do about that once it's happened. Um, they get TB in the brain, they get TB meningitis, they get tumours in the brain from, from TB. So, so for us in, in PMGH, uh, we, we've got one and a half wards just full of children with TB. And as Dr. Lavo's pointed out, um, there's very often a coexistence with, uh, with HIV infection mm. and there's very often a, a coexistence with malnutrition which is, which is very common. Mm -hmm. um, so TB causes malnutrition but malnutrition predisposes children to get TB as well be because of the, its effect on the immune system. So it's a, it's a huge problem um, mm. and uh, we, we see this big problem with multi-drug resistance in children as well as adults. Mm and then it becomes extremely difficult to, to, to treat them. To treat them. You agree, Dr. Molina? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Port Mosby General Hospital is 
is, uh, is the uh, commonest cause of admission is TB. Okay. The commonest cause of uh, death is TB in the medical ward. And uh, currently, four wards occupied by TB. And it's continued to increase. And, uh, uh, and we have to address it. I think, you know, the biggest problem is uh, trying to treat is one thing, but uh, prevention uh, is, is, is uh, one of the big causes, overcrowding. Mm -hmm. Overcrowding in the, in, in, in the same house. Many people living yeah, in the out, same like house. living in the house, like and communal, then, there's so yeah, many yeah, people exactly, that live exactly. and then yeah. Our, yeah, in, in the house. Our, the performance indicators for TB should be packed with the National Housing Commission. Okay. The more housing that you provide for families to live, live uh, in a family rather than having the entire uh, extended family, we could be able to go a long way in reducing the number of, uh, of, of uh, TB cases. If you look at the statistics, uh, uh, TB was very common in those well-developed countries, but during the Industrial Revolution when uh, people started having better water supply, better sanitation, better housing, mm -hmm. then the number of TB started coming down and even the BCG came later. Mm -hmm. TB's number started coming down when the standard of living has improved. Yes. So treating is one thing, we can invest in a lot of money in treating, but we should think about Housing people probably so that uh, people live, live as a family rather than even an entire tribe. And, like a nuclear family. Yeah, in a family per house. Se. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah. Well, thank you. We will take another short break. You're watching The Lower Show. We're here at the Apex House in Port Moresby. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Lower Show. We're here at the APEC House with Professor John Vince, Dr. Evelyn Lavu, and Dr. Paki Molumi. Gee, all these doctors and big words we're using here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel smart today. <laughs> all right, Professor Vince, child health, yep. your specialty? Yep. Well, it was, yes. <laughs> yeah? Tell us, tell us. Okay. Um, well, I think, you know, I mentioned earlier that we shouldn't all be talking about the bad things and, and one of the good things is that there has been a slow decline in, uh, in the mortality statistics in children over the last 10 years. I, I don't think anybody is absolutely sure why, what are the main reasons for that, but certainly one of the reasons is, is uh, the introduction of vaccines. Uh, we introduced um, a vaccine for the common bacteria which cause meningitis and, and pneumonia in children. Uh, called the HIV vaccine or HIV vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccines. Those have been introduced in the last uh, um, five to ten years. And, and, and the, the, we have got evidence that the introduction of the HIV vaccine, for example, uh, produced a reduction in the amount of meningitis in, in a couple of areas. Um, so I think uh, um, our current under five mortality rate is about 56 per thousand and our um, under, under one mortality is about 40, 48 now and so that, that has, has declined uh, consistently over the last few years. Um, maybe, maybe it's things like uh, simple preventative things related to education like hand washing uh, and basic sanitation issues. Um, so, so there has been some good news but I, I, ju I just want to focus on on immunization a little bit because it's so important and because in terms of health expenditure it's it's the best value for money uh, like of all that. of all the health intervention programs immunization has been shown all the way around the world to be the best value for money so people may may ask well you know we've we've had a we've had a recent polio outbreak um, and and that's absolutely true the the simple reason why we've had it is because our vaccination coverage is way below 60 percent it should be well above 90 percent it's way below uh, 60 percent uh, people may remember uh, three years ago we had a measles outbreak and there were 72,000 people affected by measles and there were at least 400 children who died 
as a result of a completely preventable disease. Um, one of the things that's happened with the outbreak response to polio is that there's been a massive coverage of polio vaccine in the country and we, we think we think that the outbreak has, has been contained but in the very last uh, um, uh, uh, outbreak response of vaccination the health department included measles and rubella vaccine Partic we're particularly interested in measles because if we don't get the coverage of measles vaccine up uh, much higher than it has been, we'll have another devastating measles outbreak. We, you can predict them. If your measles coverage drops below 70% um, or so, you can predict that every four or five years you will get a measles epidemic. So we wow. think that the action that the health department has taken in, in, making, in, in linking the measles vaccination to the, to the polio outbreak uh, will we'll prevent a, a, a major measles outbreak. But I also want to go back talking about vaccination to the point that Dr. Mollim and I made a few mm -hmm. minutes ago in terms of prevention. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and we, we talked about possible prevention for oral cancer, but we know, we know that HPV vaccine prevents cervical, cervical cancer. cancer. One, of the, one of the biggest killers for women uh, in this country. Uh, and and it, it's not 100% effective, but it's about 90% effective. If, if, if young people get vaccinated with HPV, HPV vaccine, their chances of developing, for the women developing cervical cancer, are reduced by about 90%. Isn't yeah, that, and that and they get that in, what are the ages for that? For uh, the well, we're, we're, we're focusing on between 9 and 15. Yeah. Years old? Mm -hmm. 9 and 15 years old, yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. So, so and, and, you know, we've run, there's been run pilot, uh, yeah, pilot um, uh, projects, projects with it, yeah. Um, obviously, obviously, there are issues about acceptability of this of this vaccine, um, but with and, and it requires a lot of social social uh, information, social education to get people to understand um, the importance of, of this vaccine. But we would hope, not just from the paediatric point of view, but it's, it involves mm. everybody really, mm. that we would hope that the health department uh, and, the, and the donor agencies can help us to, to roll out the HPV vaccine. It's difficult because we're talking about a disease which is going to hit people in 20 years time, 30 years time. But the evidence from around the world is that this vaccine works uh, with about a 90% you know, efficacy. Mm. So it's very, very important. Very All important. vaccines. Oh, there's no reason. Well, that, that's, silly, that's a silly thing to say because we know that delivering vaccines to the really remote areas is difficult. Right. You know, is one thing, yeah. Okay, in Port Moresby, we should. In Port Moresby, we should have 100% coverage. Yeah. Sure. But when you get out to Telefomin or the back of Western Province, it's a, it's an entirely different pro, uh, um, a problem. And it requires very careful planning, very careful management. requires requires adequate financing of the of the various uh, you know di at the district level. Uh, but it's feasible. It is feasible. Uh, and so so you know anybody watching this, I'd like to make yes. a plea. Please get your children vaccinated, and make sure all your family members get their children vaccinated because it's so important. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And it comes back to your point about prevention. Prevention, yeah. yes, yes. Also, adding on, the older women will not get yet vaccinated, but you can have a pap smear done. Yes. You know, it's really sad to see women die of cervical cancer. And not just village women, educated women. We think it will not happen to me, and we just postpone and postpone. Please get a pap smear if you haven't had one done. From what age do you recommend? 21 yeah. up, if, but also depending on what time they start having sex. Because it's activity. a sexually transmitted infection, the human papilloma virus. So the earlier exposure, like you mentioned, of the mouth cancer, the same thing. In PNG too, we've seen younger women develop um, cancer. and people in their late 20s, that's very young to mm. have cancer. Mm. Survival cancer. So if you are watching, get a pap smear, please. And for you the can developed, save your people life. in the developed countries, they can also get a lab test, I, and I believe. And also, if you have the opportunity, it's expensive, but get a HPV test 
instead of a pap smear. Because if you get a HPV test, which we don't have in the country yet, but we have the equipment, mm -hmm. you can take five years, where else if you have a normal pap smear, the next one you do is three years. And you know, if you look at it, whether you're private, public, it's not expensive. The amount of food we buy, which also kills ourselves. <laughs> Contributes to the lifestyle, yeah, lifestyle yeah. diseases as well. Yes, very I'm also good talking about HPV vaccination. We should also vaccinate the boys as well because after right. all, the girls are going to get true. it from the boys. Oh, yes. yes, very true. So uh, currently, we don't have that program in place to vaccinate the boys. No, we are, we're, we're just vaccinating we're, we're just girls. Vaccinating girls, girls at the minute. Okay. Well, well, we're not actually. It's just very limited. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Pilot, pilot project. Pilot project but, yeah. Yeah. but we need. But, we need but to that's roll a very good in, point. In, in most countries now, they're vaccinating both, both. boys and yeah. girls. Yeah. And I think that's important oh, too, it is isn't it? Important, yeah. Yeah. You're right. One. Yeah. You do one half of the yeah. population, and what about? Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vince. We will be right back on The Lower Show. Don't go away. Welcome back to The Lower Show. We're just finishing up this episode where we've talked about some very heavy topics in health and I just wanted to give you all an opportunity to say your final words before we go. <laughs> Did you want to start? All right. You've got a I'll... really nice smile on there. <laughs> <laughs> okay well first uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and come and talk about very important issues. I mean I, I think all three of us are sort of pretty passionate about what we do. Um, I think uh, on, on a number of issues we've touched on, TB, cervical cancer, mouth cancer, uh, childhood illnesses, you know, we're, we're, we're focusing on prevention and I think uh, prevention is, is linked to education, isn't it? I mean, if we, can, if we can educate our population about the issues that we've been talking about and, and, and if the population is, is, can understand what we're talking about and can take preventive action, um, then we can reduce the, the amount of expenses that we need to put on curative medicine. Curative and preventive medicine, they're both terribly important. I mean, we've all had relatives with, with very serious disease which have required um, you know, curative medicine, but we also need to focus, as, as a population, we need to focus on, on preventive things. Very simple things, hand washing, right. you know, safe disposal of feces, getting our children immunized, making sure that we don't waste all our money on gambling or, or buying nonsense, non-foods. And I want to be careful what I say No, here. that's fine. You go right <laughs> on ahead. That is completely fine. Um, but, the, the, you know, the issue is people, people spend their money on, on rubbish, really. And so, so focusing on what we can do to prevent illness is, is so important. So again, thank you very much for allowing us to talk about these things. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you for having us to talk about issues like Prophet said. Uh, for me, like all of us, prevention is better than cure. So all those TB patients, you know, if you have relatives who you think have TB, encourage them to get treated so that we can reduce the burden of TB in Papua New Guinea. It's a big issue. Now we're going to drug resistance. We know we can't make our own drugs. We have to rely on other countries, other funding to buy our drugs. But it's good to see the government buying our TB drugs, so that's a good thing. So sometimes our government is responsible in TB and we need to keep working together to um, prevent TB. And come early, don't wait till you can't walk. You know, doctors, we are not God. You have to come early so you can be treated and cured. TB is curable. And cervical cancer, I run a pap smear clinic for my village women. It's called the Love Association. And we've been doing that for the last five years now. And it's a program and we follow women up. And I'm surprised to see that it's the younger women that are showing early signs of cancer. The older generation are fine. I think they're doing well. But you know, we younger one, ones need to be educated a bit more. 
My final plea, apart from vaccinating children, is to the ladies, if you haven't had a pep smear, do it today. Don't wait till tomorrow. It may be too late. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lavo. Final words? Yeah, no, thank you for this opportunity to come here on the show and uh, inform the public of, uh, of what we are doing. It's, uh, the, pop the population has increased. The resources are limited. But we are trying our best to deliver the health care to our people. Uh, but as we've said, I think mostly in this, in this program, is uh, prevention is the way to go. And uh, uh, like Port Mosby General Hospital, we are building up infrastructure to build a level 7 hospital, uh, to do super, super specialist services, the neurosurgery, uh, heart surgery. Uh, but the running costs of those are very, very high. And to treat, it's, it's very, very expensive to treat. But uh, we can simply stop getting there by the preventive measures that we, we talk about. And uh, lifestyle disease is killing us, diabetes, hypertension, uh, the rate of heart attack and uh, stroke has gone right up. So uh, soon PMGH will set up uh, facilities for early diagnosis, uh, preventive medicine. Uh, we diagnose cancer early, we diagnose uh, heart disease early so that uh, we can treat our population at an uh, at, uh, early stage before they go into complications because, or late stage, because when they go into late stage, as well, like uh, stroke, the cost of looking after a stroke patient is, mm. is very high. Sure. When we can uh, diagnose early and, uh, and, and treat early, and that's the direction for most of the general is looking at, whilst we are building our facilities to to treat those and do high, high technical stuff, but at the same time, we want to drive programs that will uh, involve uh, early diagnosis and uh, early treatment. Yep. In that way, we can uh, we can uh, we can save yeah, in uh, safe cost in running healthcare if we invest more into prevention and uh, early diagnosis. Fantastic! Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Mumini. Thank you once again, Professor John Vince, Dr. Evelyn Lavu, and Dr. Paki Molumi for your time. It's been an absolute privilege and honor to listen to your intellect, honestly, and for sharing that with all our viewers today. We're coming to you from the APEC House in Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea. Do follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and on Instagram. You don't want to miss out future episodes. And if you have missed this one out, you can find it on either page or the links thereof. And also to find out more information about these three wonderful guests today. Once again, we'd like to thank our host venue, APEC House in Port Moresby, and we will see you next time on The Lower Show.